526. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I cannot trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. So put me in the whelming flood When all around my soul gives way Heaven is all my hope and stay On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand shall come with trumpet sound, oh, then I shall in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sun. people said. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Wonderful great truths of the imputed righteousness of Christ. Not righteousness that we gain, but righteousness which he gives to us by grace through faith. You may have noticed in the last verse, I changed some words. I do that every time I sing this hymn. When he shall come with trumpet sound, the way it's written is, O oh, may I then in him be found. If you are a believer, you can sing it, O oh, then I shall in him be found. For you are in Christ, Ephesians chapter 1. When you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you were placed permanently and forever in Christ. When he shall come with trumpet sound, O oh, then I shall in him be found great truths of the Reformation and great truths of Scripture. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, now to our text for this morning, which I read a little bit earlier, which is in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. I'll read it again. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the magnificence of Scripture. How we thank you for these eternal truths which you moved your emanuenses to pen for us, in this case Paul, to give to us your word which never changes, your word which endures, your word which is a, a solid rock. 
your word which is not yea and nay, but your word which is truth. We pray that you will take the word of God. Open our hearts by your spirit to pay attention. Keep our minds from wandering to the things of this past week or worrying about the things of this coming week or blindly floating. Keep us awake. Keep us alert. Keep us attentive. For this is your word, this is your truth. And someday we will be held accountable for what we do with it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you know, we have just finished studying 14 weeks of the spiritual gifts last week. And you'll recall that one of the spiritual gifts, and it's listed both in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and in Romans chapter 12 as a spiritual gift, is the gift of faith. We saw that faith, when used in the context of spiritual gifts, gives every believer the capacity to grow spiritually when they choose to walk by faith. We saw it stated in 1 Corinthians 12.9. We saw it stated again in Romans 12.3. In verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 12, to another, faith by the same spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. And he goes on with many more of those gifts. In Romans 12.3, we found out that it was an every believer gift. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And later on, he goes on and speaks of how the different gifts are used according to the proportion of faith. And so we see it as an every believer gift. But there are some striking differences as well as similarities with the faith of the spiritual gift and the faith that is spoken of in our text today. For by grace are ye saved through faith. This is saving faith that we're talking about here and not merely faith as a spiritual gift to be used for the edification of the body of Christ. You will look at this text today and you'll recall that when we studied the gift of faith, the term faith is used in at least five different ways in Scripture, especially the New Testament. First of all, we see it used of saving faith. And that is what we have here in the context of Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. We have saving faith. By grace, you are saved through faith. This is saving faith that we're talking about in Ephesians 2.8. The second thing that we saw was sanctifying faith. And the Apostle Paul mentions how they were sanctified by faith that was in Christ as he was speaking to the Ephesian elders. There is saving faith, there is sanctifying faith, and of course, the spiritual gift of faith which we spent some time studying. But we also saw that faith is listed in Galatians chapter 5, as the fruit of the Spirit. Not only is it a gift of the Spirit, whereby we can minister to others, but it is the fruit of the Spirit as well. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And then, of course, we spoke of the faith. When the definite article in, occurs in front of that word, we know that there is something, a body of truth, the faith that was once and for all delivered unto the saints, for which we are to contend. And that is what Jude tells us. There is a definitive, distinctive, articulate, complete body of truth, which the scripture calls the faith, once and for all delivered to the saints. It always centers around the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is that which we are to defend and for which we are willing to die. That was the heart of the Reformation. That cry out of Habakkuk chapter 2, the just shall live by faith, repeated by the Apostle Paul in Romans and also repeated in Galatians. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. 
and the men and women who believe that were willing to die for it. We celebrate that today, but very few of us have ever faced a critical situation whereby someone might kill us if we did not deny the faith. There are Christians around the world today who do face death because they will not deny the faith. Those of you who receive communications from the Voice of the Martyrs know that this is happening in Africa. It's happening in India. It's happening in China. It's happening in Afghanistan. It's happening in Pakistan. It's happening in all the Muslim countries around the world. Anyone who becomes known as a Christian is threatened with death and in some cases killed. Dear people, that's our heritage. And dear people, unless God intervenes, that is our future. We live in a window of great blessing and prosperity here in the United States today. So as we study faith, this saving faith, which we're going to see has some very specific character qualities to it. As we study that, put in your mind the question, am I willing to die for my faith? Am I willing to give up all of my earthly possessions for faith in Christ? I mentioned that a moment ago as we sang the hymn, The Mighty Fortress is Our God. How few things we as Christians in the United States are willing to give up for Christ. We hang on to it, we covet it, we store it, we house it. We can't even look at it sometimes. It's there in the bank, sort of in digital numbers out in ether space somewhere. What are you willing to give up for Christ? Did you know if it's his, he can take it at any time that he wants? Remember that. If it is his, and if you are his, it is his, he can take it from you at any time that he wants. Faith. What are you willing to give up for your faith? What are you willing to do to propagate your faith? We have a description of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the substance. Let's pause on that word for a moment. Substance is that which is real. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. In a court of law, there has to be evidence. Evidence is designed to prove truth. Evidence is designed to present reality. Evidence is put before a jury and a judge so that they might discern what really is. Faith is both substance and faith is evidence. The substance of things hoped for, that is what gives solidity to the things that we have not yet seen, the things that are in heaven. That gives us evidence that what God has said is true. We look at God and what he has done in the past we read his word and see the promises that he has made and that gives us the evidence that we have a reliable God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But now there's something here in our text today in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 that I never want you to forget. If you don't take anything away from this sermon except this truth, out of Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, here it is. Don't ever forget it. Genuine faith always, not sometimes, genuine faith always results in action. Genuine faith always 
results in action. Let me put it another way. Genuine faith always results in works of righteousness. That's the specific action that is described for us in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Genuine faith always results in works of righteousness. James tells us the same thing in James chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, excuse me, chapter 2, 17 and 18. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. He's going to ask the question later on, can that kind of faith save a man? No, it cannot. Because that's a dead faith. That's a phony faith. That's a faith that has an exterior show, but has no internal reality. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Now, the works don't save you. Genuine faith results in works of righteousness. If you have a faith that never shows up in the way in which you live, if no works of righteousness from God's definition of righteousness, if no works of righteousness ever appear in your life, if there is never any fruit, if you want to use Jesus' metaphor, it means that your faith is phony. There are many people walking around today talking about faith. The question is not your internal faith, because we're told that faith is not from us. You're saved by faith and that not of yourselves. Faith has to have a concrete object of faith. If you trust in something that is unreliable, no matter how great your faith is, you are going to fall. If I came up here and sat in one of these chairs and some prankster had unscrewed the screws that hold it together and popped the glue out and then cut the tenons in the, that go in, you know what, I'd sit on that chair and it doesn't matter how many times I've sat on it and trusted it, that time I trusted it, it would fall. Your object of faith not only has to be reliable once, your object of faith has to be reliable continuously. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you my faith by my works. It's not a matter of salvation. It's a matter of expression. Did you hear that? It's not a matter of salvation, our works. It's a matter of expression. There is no way you can reveal your faith and prove it to be genuine unless it has an outworking in your life where other people can see it. Try to prove your faith. That's James's point here. Without works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show you my faith by my works. The faith precedes the works. And in every case, genuine faith will produce works of righteousness. Like the seed our Lord Jesus Christ spoke of. He says in those harvests you're going to see that some brings forth thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, and some an hundredfold. But every one produces a crop. Dear folks, we're talking about the heart of the Reformation here. We're talking about faith that produces works, not the list of works that Rome gives for you in order to get saved. We're talking about something that springs from the inside out, not something that is externally imposed that you must do to get there. Faith without works is dead, being alone. And that, of course, is what we see in our text today, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Verse 8 told us about saved by grace through faith. Now he tells us what is the end result of the faith in verse 10. He also tells us, just like our saving faith came from Christ, he tells us where the outworking of our faith comes from. It is from God himself, not from us. Listen, we are his workmanship. 
workmanship. That means we're the piece that's being worked on by the master craftsman. We are the raw lumber that is being carved the way God wants it carved. We are the clay that is being molded into the pot the way God wants it to be molded into the pot. We are his workmanship. Notice the next word. Created in Christ Jesus. When you think of the term created, we just had our mini creation conference a month ago. And as we held that conference, we talked about creation. Creation didn't make itself. That's what the evolutionists would like you to think. You start with nothing, a big bang happens, and suddenly out of nothing you've got something. We were created. That's physically true, is it not? Did you know that your spiritual life, just as God breathed into Adam the breath of life and man became a living soul, and God made animals that were alive and fishes that were alive and birds that were alive, and God put life in his creation, the same thing is true with your spiritual life. We weren't just sort of haphazardly put together in Christ Jesus. We were created in Christ Jesus. So he's told us, by grace you're saved through faith, and that, what is your nearest antecedent? It's the word faith. That, not of yourselves. Faith is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. God is the one who gave you the gift of faith. And we're not just talking about spiritual gifts here, because we're talking about salvation by grace you're saved through faith. And that faith is not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Both in English and in Greek, that is your nearest antecedent. And God is talking about how he gave you saving faith. All the rules of grammar and, of course, the scripture as a whole support the fact that your salvation is a gift from God through faith that God gave you. That is an incredible truth. But notice the next thing. Not only is this related to creation, God is the one who's doing it. You can't create yourself. But God created us in Christ Jesus on two good works. Notice the next phrase. Which God... And now, what's the which refer to? The good works, that's your nearest antecedent. Which God, the good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The good works aren't haphazard either. The good works aren't a matter of, well, I sure hope those little creatures down there that I've given some life to will run around and do something good and help little old ladies across the street and, you know, donate to their local charities and, uh, you know, uh, march against abortion and uh, all those things. Hmm, many good things. It says God created us to good works that he before ordained that we should walk in them. In other words, the two key elements that interplay in these passages. Number one, faith always precedes work. Not sometimes, but always. Faith always precedes works. Any works that show up without faith, God calls them evil. They are not good works from God's perspective because they are done in the power of the flesh and in the flesh dwells no good thing. Unregenerate man cannot do good works in God's sight. He may do things that are benevolent to other people. He may do things that look like they are charitable. He may do imitations of good works that believers are doing. But remember, even the spiritual gifts can be counterfeited. The flesh can counterfeit tongues. The world can counterfeit tongues for manipulative purposes. The devil and his demons can counterfeit tongues. Every one of those sign gifts are being counterfeited today. The Holy Spirit's no longer giving them. And every one of the service gifts can be counterfeited by the world, the flesh, and the devil too. Every one of the leadership gifts in the church can be counterfeited. We see it in churches all around this community here. Unsaved people preaching a false gospel out of pulpits in buildings Perhaps not quite as large as this, but they're doing it. 
That's why this church pulled out of the one five blocks down the street from us. Because it was a denomination that taught a false gospel. They have clergy. They have vestments. They go through the rituals of the ordinances. It's a counterfeit. Faith can be counterfeited as well. But faith always precedes works. That's principle number one. Precedes works. Number two, faith always produces works. Not sometimes, but always. Precedes and produces. Precedes and produces. Do you have it? Precedes and produces. Precedes and produces. Genuine faith always precedes good works. Genuine faith always produces good works. That's the point both of Paul and of James. That is why you cannot do good works in order to obtain salvation. That is also why you cannot claim to be saved even though you never do good works from a divine perspective. Why? Because we just read it. Because God has predestined good works to be performed by the elect to whom he has given saving faith. He starts the process. He turns the car on. And then the car begins to drive down the road. And either you're going to have the flesh at the wheel or you're going to have the Holy Spirit at the wheel. And when the Holy Spirit is at the wheel, you will do the good works that God has before ordained that you will walk in them. That's specifically what it says here in verse 10. Always. Remember Ephesians chapter 2.10, that we are his workmanship, not our own workmanship. You know, that is precisely what Paul says in Romans chapter 9. The potter makes a pot according to the will of the potter. The pot is made not according to the will of the pot. Some are made to honor and some are made to dishonor. The pot is made by the potter who chooses precisely the shape, whether it will be a tall, slender vase, whether or not it will be a spittoon. The potter chooses which vessels to make in the way that he wishes to make them. Listen to Romans chapter 9. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. For the children not yet being born, neither having done any good or evil, in other words, God didn't look down the corridors of time and see, oh, I can see this one's going to do good and this one's going to do evil. So I'll make my choices on that base, basis. Friends, if you believe that, you are making history, you're making God subject to history rather than making history subject to God. God is in charge of history. God was not required to make anything at the very beginning. He could have made Bork and Zog instead of Adam and Eve. He could have made people to be green blobs that slithered along the ground. Or he could have made them as he did in his own image. God is not subject to history. History is subject to God. And so Paul goes on here. The children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works. Remember, that's what we just read over in Ephesians chapter 2. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works. Same phrase Paul uses here. Not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. God makes choices to love whom he will. Those of you who are married or who have been married, know that you made a choice at some point. You made a choice to love one specific individual. You made a choice that this was the one for you, and you sealed it and signed the covenant that this is yours forever. Dear friends, in this world, those covenants get broken. But in eternity, God never breaks his covenant with those whom he has loved and chosen and called and saved. We see that at the end of Romans 9. We won't go that far today, but we read just a few more verses here. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Somebody's going to say, that's not fair. That's the typical human response because man starts off assuming that God must love him. He's, after all, such a lovely creature. 
Shall we say, is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Is that not the rights of God? I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth. Pause on that phrase for a moment. Paul is talking about election here. He's talking about salvation. He's talking about who makes the choice that is the determinative choice. And he tells us, so then, it is not of him that willeth. It's not the human will that makes the determinative choice. When we look back in our experience at the point where we trusted Christ for our salvation, and what an exciting, wonderful time that was. God opened our eyes and we saw that Jesus was who he said he was. He had done what he said he had done. He died in our place on Calvary's cross and was buried and rose again. And at that moment, with joy in our hearts, we trusted him and he gave us eternal life. But there was something that preceded that. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth. No matter how hard you strive, even if you're a very good runner, you can't win this race unless it is God who gives you the life to do it. But of him, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture, and he gives an illustration. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. How come Pharaoh got to the throne? Why was it that through all those dynasties of Egyptians, and all those different Pharaohs who lived and died, and all the infighting that went on in the families, and all the assassinations that took place, and all of the victorious conquests of Egypt as it grew to its power and to its might, and all of the things that happened whereby one man and one woman came together and they had a baby who grew up to be Pharaoh at precisely the time of the Exodus. It's because God superintends history. Nothing happens apart from his will. And God had a specific Pharaoh that he was going to put on the throne who would harden his heart when God called for the children of Israel to go and serve him. And the cry, let my people go, was answered with a stern no, and God sent the plagues of Egypt to destroy the gods of Egypt and to show that he alone, Jehovah, the God of Israel, is the true and living God. That's what Paul's talking about here. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh. Here's the scripture that speaks to Pharaoh and to every other leader in the world today. Even for this same purpose. Did you know God has a purpose? He's not just not meandering through history and throwing flowers and petals here and there and wondering what's going to happen when they fall down. He's not biting his fingernails in heaven. He has a purpose and he has a sovereign power to accomplish his will. Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up. And you know what it was, Pharaoh? So that I could smash you and show that I'm greater than you. That's what it says in the next verse. That I might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. The scripture tells us two things. It tells us Pharaoh hardened his heart, and it tells us that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath, because God is going to manifest all of his character, 
And part of that is his wrath against sin. And so God has chosen to show his wrath, to make his power known. He endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Even with the vessels of wrath, God has shown forbearance and patience. That's why the world has not yet been destroyed. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Do you remember what it talked about? How we were created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained. God has prepared us unto glory. He created us in Christ Jesus. That's the opening theme of the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. He created us in a certain way unto good works, just like created birds to fly and fish to swim, those things which they must do. He specifically predestined which good works we would do. God hath before ordained. He defines what the good works are. He commands good works. He empowers good works. He determines which good works are in need, when and where. He motivates us to do the good works, and then, which is astounding, and then he rewards us for good works and holds us accountable for doing them or for not doing them. Holds us accountable. That's what God does with his moral creation. But if he did them, why should he reward us for doing them? If he predestined them, why should he give us benefit and credit for them. Do you understand that this is a matter of grace, just like your salvation? Just like your faith? Your good works are also a matter of the grace of God, choosing to use you and me as an instrument in His hands. He is the one who is behind it. He's the one who is the strength. He is the one who is the true craftsman. He is the one who takes these crude tools that we are and uses them to accomplish such perfect things for his glory. Good works are not what we do in our flesh, and good works are not what determine good works in the sight of God. Good works follow the express instructions given by God. Do you, do you remember the test for good works from the divine perspective? You've heard me say this before. We've got to emphasize it at this point. Because all around us we see people doing benevolent things. Now some places around the world you don't see hardly anybody doing benevolent things. But here in the United States there are a lot of do-gooders. But what are good works from God's perspective? First, works that are done in obedience to the word of God. Any work that is not in obedience to the word of God is clearly not a good work. Number two, works that are done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Anything that is done in the flesh is not a good work. God says so. Number three, works that are done in faith. That's the whole point of our text today. It's a proof of genuine faith. It is the result of genuine faith. And fourth, works that are done to the glory of God. Whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Every work that does not meet that test is not a good work if it's done to the glory of man, if it's done for self-glorification, which is why millionaires give huge amounts of money to different charitable organizations so that they will then get their name inscribed on a building or so that they will get their name in the organization's magazine uh, with this gigantic, and you've seen these pictures, this gigantic facsimile of a check. And they're shaking hands with the president of the organization and holding this big check up that says $1 million. That's not a good work, folks. Because it does not give glory to God. Genuine faith always desires to give glory to God. And that is what good works are from God's perspective. Now you might argue that's not fair for holding us accountable for not doing good works if he is the one who predestines the good works. Of course, if that were true, the obverse would also be true. It's not fair that he gives us heavenly rewards for doing the good works either since he's the one who ordained them. He's the one who empowered them. He's the one who caused us to do them. No, the correct response, and I see from our clock that we're running out of time, so I'll try to close this quickly. The correct response and understanding is this. It is all of God and nothing of man. 
And yet he chooses to exercise his grace toward us and to give us that which we do not deserve. If he gave us what we deserve, we would all end in hell. The question is not, how can a loving God send anyone to hell? The real question is, how can a just and righteous God send anyone to heaven? And that's the question that has been answered by the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. God owes us nothing. If we got what we deserved, we would all end in flames. But our God is a loving and merciful God, and that's why he sent Christ to die for our sins on Calvary's cross. Some will argue predestination to salvation and good works is fatalism. Oh, they say you're teaching some kind of a Hindu or pagan fatalism. You're, you're teaching hopelessness and despair. Not at all. There's an enormous difference between fatalism and predestination. There's an enormous difference between fatalism and election. There's an enormous difference between the sovereignty of God and the grinding, inescapable wheels of fate. In fatalism, there is no moral responsibility. In fatalism, there's no moral accountability. In fatalism, there is nothing that a man who... Wa now listen carefully. In fatalism, there is nothing that a man who wants to escape can do to escape the jaws of the inevitable. Fatalism presents man as earnestly desiring to please the gods. But no matter what he does, the gods capriciously beat him into a pulp. Under fatalism, a man becomes jaded and bitter and soon ceases to believe in the gods and he turns to naturalism and the law of tooth and fang known today as evolution. He has no hope because in the end he knows he's dead and he believes that death ends it all. He believed that he started as good but that forces outside his control ground him down while he heroically struggled to hold back the overwhelming odds. Fatalism, you see, starts with the wrong view of man. And that's why it ends in hopelessness. Predestination starts with the view that man begins as a depraved, rotten, filthy, vile sinner. Not only is there nothing that he can do in that state, in the sight of a holy God, but more importantly, he does not want to do what is truly righteous. He starts in rebellion against God. He starts with the view that God must conform to man's way of salvation, to man's definition of good works, to man's self-centered con concept of righteousness and justice and fair play. You see, from the Bible's viewpoint, man is not in a heroic struggle against a petty, recalcitrant, capricious God who this man is trying to do good against all odds. No, man begins in a state of rebellion. He is in a rebellious struggle against a merciful and gracious God who has paid already an infinite price for our salvation. What a difference between fatalism and predestination. The truth that God predestines our genuine good works of faith also cements the truth stated in our text today, faith, the gift of God. The word of God is the final arbiter of it all. Faith is complete confidence in the word of God. Saving faith is created in the elect by what the sovereign God reveals himself to be. You know, I have come across many times, in fact, several times even this week, uh, people who come to me because they're angry, someone who has offended them, they want to get even, they're bitter, they're frustrated, they want revenge. They're praying hateful prayers against the person who did wrong. They're walking in the flesh, not the spirit. They refuse to manifest the spirit of Christ. They want to see their adversary dead. They're full of malice and hatred. Have you ever been there? I suspect you have. I have. And I have to confess it is sin whenever it happens. I feel that welling up inside of me. That's the flesh. I have to confess it is sins. I've had it many times in my life that the angry spirit has hit me as well. But did you know the Lord Jesus had something very important to say about that? 
James tells us first in James 1, 2, and 3, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. When those things hit you, it's because God has a purpose of developing patience in you. Listen to what Jesus said about when someone does things against you that are bad things. Maybe they do them over and over again. Some of you have experienced that, where the same person keeps coming back at you and it's like it wears you thin after a while. So listen to what Jesus said about it and then listen to the response of the disciples. Luke 17. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Oh, what beautiful words, they got it. Increase our faith. Faith. Faith is the key to the Christian life. Whether in terms of walking forward and growing, or in terms of being willing to put up with the abuse that the world will give you for being a Christian, Lord, increase our faith. And we see how small our faith is because in the next verse Jesus said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. To us that seems unreasonable, it seems irrational, it seems impossible to repeatedly forgive someone who sins against us over and over and over and over again. If it seems that way, do you remember verse 6? That tells us how paltry our faith is. It tells us that the great faith we think we have is really puny, like a 90-pound punk when our faith is put to the test. It also means we probably have a very scrawny prayer life with very little victory when pressure is on and when we have to face real tests. And the tests of our faith may be coming soon, folks. We live in a country that's going through crisis right now. And you know who always is, in the end, considered the scapegoat? The one who the world will say caused the problems. It's the people of God. Doesn't matter where you go in history, that is the conclusion. If you start at Nero, that's what you find as the conclusion. If you want to look at Hitler, not only Jews, but Christians, six million Christians were killed by Hitler as well as the Jews. I discovered that in Israel. Studying in Israel, Jews teaching that at the Hebrew University, that not only the Jews were the subjects of the Holocaust, but the Christians. I want to bring that to Muslim countries? I want to bring that perhaps to the United States? The test of faith, the test of prayer, James 1, 6 through 8, we won't read it again. All of these usages of faith have one thing in common. All of them fit the definition that faith is complete confidence in the word of God. Saving faith is created in the elect by what the sovereign God reveals himself to be. Oh, we could go on and talk about the different usages for gift. The spiritual gift word is charisma, you know that in the word charismatic an empowerment designed to build up the body of Christ. But the word gift here in Ephesians 2.8 is doron. This is an exciting word. This is the kind of gift that is freely bestowed by a donor to a person, a donee, who has not worked for it. It's a gift that comes without obligation on the part of the donor. It's the type of gift that is given out of love, not out of coercion. It is the type of gift where the giver, out of his own free will, considers the object of his beneficence, and then decides 
on precisely the type, the quality, and the quantity of the gift without undue influence from the person who will receive the gift. In the case of faith and salvation, it is a gift that is always sovereignly given and received and never rejected because God himself changes the heart of rebellion and makes the human heart willing to receive it. In other words, the gift of saving faith is a love gift from God. He was not obligated to give it to anyone. He, as the giver, has the right to give his gift to anyone whom he will. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your gracious gift of salvation, your gracious gift of faith. For without faith it is impossible to please you. Without faith there is no salvation. Faith that does not result in the empowered and enabled works that you have predestined is not a real faith. It's not a saving faith because genuine faith always precedes good works and genuine faith always produces good works. Works of righteousness. Works that comply with the requirements that you have laid down in your word. Help us, Father, to understand these principles, for they are indeed those things which underlie the foundation of the Reformation. The men of God who began to study faith and understand that it affects what you say and it affects what you do and you're willing to stand in the face of all opposition even if they kill you. A faith that results in works of righteousness, an open expression so that others might see. Father, we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.